And we are live with Dr. Howard Fuller. Dr. Howard Fuller um, is a distinguished professor of education and founder, director of the Institute for Transformation of Learning at Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Before that position, uh, Dr. Fuller had been the superintendent of the Milwaukee Public Schools. He also has been a lifelong advocate and activist for black education, black freedom, black liberation in many forms, but uh, definitely within education. He has a background in social work, background in community organizing, a background in general agitation of the white <laughs> supremacist structure. <laughs> and when it comes to education activism, as I see it, the activism that leaves the educational process self-determined by black people themselves for black people, we have one in the country. That is Dr. Fuller. Good morning, Dr. Fuller. Thank you for being here. Hey, good morning, Chris. It's uh, really good to be with you. I appreciate the opportunity, man. Good to see you, too. I love it. Good to see you, too, man. Always good to see you. I, you know, the thing that you're not going to do to me today, though, that I'm going to tell everybody, I'm going to warn everybody. Every time I get off a conversation with you, I have to jump in my Kindle and order five books. <laughs> and uh, see, what's not going to happen this time is I'm not going to be uh, uh, ordering five books again. <laughs> um, I'm going to try not to, but this is one book I want everybody to see, No Struggle, No Progress, which is Dr. Fuller's book, A Warrior's Life from Black Power to Education Reform. Um, I was reacquainting myself with this book yesterday, knowing that we were going to talk today, but let's just start it with something that's the most simple, the, um, the title, No Struggle, no, prog uh, no Progress. Let's teach people what that means and where that comes from. Yeah, well, it comes from Frederick Douglass, right? And it's you know, for years and years and years, and even now, I used to end my speeches by, you know, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. And so, uh, you know, when Lisa Fraser Page and I got together to deal with the book, we were struggling for a title, and that title just came to me. And what's really interesting, as you know, and I've talked about it before, that that photograph of me that's on the cover, mm. uh, that took place the day after Martin Luther King was killed. And so I was leading a demonstration in Durham, North Carolina. And uh, if you look closely, you can see that there's this worried look on my face. Because and that was because <laughs> we, were, we, <laughs> we, were, we were on one side of the street and the Klan was on the other. Wow. And, and when Billy Barnes snapped that picture, I had looked up on this, um, up on the bank building. Uh, and there were these three white dudes with high powered rifles. Uh, on the bank building. And you can imagine the tension, you know, the day after King was assassinated and you got the Klan and you got white men up on, up on the roof with rifles. And mm -hmm. so the moment he snapped that picture was the moment that I spotted them on the roof. So, so um, no struggle, no uh, progress, power can seize nothing without a demand, never has, never was. Uh, why, why is Frederick Douglass important to the way that we look at struggle today? Well, he's important to me is because he was able to crystallize the nature of that struggle. And I've read a lot of different speeches by, by Frederick Douglass. And of course he was a, an abolitionist and, and was engaged in a certain extent with the abolitionist movement, but he was also a voice for black self-determination with the context of a broader movement which is something that I think we have to understand today. It is how do you work with allies of different races, but at the same time, maintain your sense of your right to be self-determining? And then how do, you, how do you do that? And how do you understand who's with you and who's not with you? So for example, as you may have seen, I sent out this tweet about, I'm very concerned about people out here talking about we all in this together. <laughs> my, my question is who the hell is the we? Uh -huh. Because there's a whole bunch of we that is not a part of my we, and mm -hmm. we definitely are not in this together. And we have to be clear as to who our friends are, who our enemies are, who our allies are, you know, at every moment in history, but particularly at a moment like this. It's so important to have uh, allies across different lines. I notice uh, on your book, on the back cover, people should read it. It's an interesting 
Um, it's an interesting story about how you met with the president in 2001, who was George Bush, George W. Bush. And you went in, I think, probably with one kind of idea of what could be in that meeting. <laughs> and you came away actually thinking, you know, they these people don't know who I am. We can work together, but they probably don't know who I am. What 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 is it that they didn't know about you? Well, let, let me explain. As, as you know, Chris, I'm, I'm a firm believer in Derek Bell's notion of interest convergence theory. And in, in his book, Silent Covenants, he, he really gets into detail about what does that mean? And essentially what he said is that if you go back and look at the civil rights movement, the reason why Black people were able to make progress was because at that moment in time, the United States was trying to convince the rest of the world that democracy was a better form of government than communism. Hard to do that with bull counter sicking dogs on mm -hmm. people. So at a certain point in time, the white ruling class called him and said, hey man, you gotta quit sicking dogs on people because you messing up a larger uh, thing that we're trying to get done here. So at that moment in time, our interests converge with their interests and certain things move forward. That's how Derek Bell explained this. Mm -hmm. But but the issue, though, Chris, is this, is that when I met with George Bush, for some people, a meeting with George Bush was a matter of principle. Mm -hmm. For me, it was a matter of strategy and tactics. Mm -hmm. But if you were to look at Trump today, I could never meet with Donald Trump because it's a matter of principle. Mm -hmm. And so even though there's a, there's a concept of interest convergence theory, every one of us at some point point in time have to draw a line mm -hmm. that, hey, this is not an interest that I can converge with. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that, that's a very difficult thing to do, right? Because one of the, the problems you have when you're engaged in struggle is always being clear about what is the difference between principle versus strategy and tactics. Mm -hmm. But something that is for me, an issue of strategy and tactics, maybe for you, an issue of principle. And that's where some of the, the difficulty comes in when you're trying to do work. If I thought that it was um, helpful and useful to black education to move the ball forward for kids, especially um, that I accept an invitation to go to the White House to meet with uh, uh, Donald Trump or uh, go to the U.S. Department of Education, meet with Betsy DeVos. Uh, and I called you and I said, Howard, I got this opportunity to go talk to these people about black education, what would you say? I would say, uh, <laughs> don't invite me because I ain't. Gonna, I mean, but but you but would it, tell me that you would literally be like, I'm not going with you. No, 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 I'm not. Yeah. No, I can't. I can't. I, I, no, no, that, that, no. I could. I could not under any circumstances meet with 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 Donald Trump. And and as people know, Betsy DeVos and I have been friends for like 17 years or longer, and. But but I had a conversation with Betsy and just simply said, you know, I'm never going to say anything negative about you because I'm not. I don't see her in the same way a whole lot of other people do. But I can't meet with her because she works for Donald Trump. That's mm -hmm. that's the problem, right? Because to me, Donald Trump is clearly he, he's like the 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 Andrew Johnson of our times mm -hmm. times ten. Mm -hmm. And so when you when when you when you when you see it in that way. There's no way that there's any point that we can sit down and talk. Mm -hmm. But but if you said you were gonna go, I'm not gonna be mad at you, Chris. You know what I mean? I mean that's that's a decision that that you have to make, and I assume you're making that decision in the same way that I am. Mm -hmm. Except for you, it wouldn't be a matter of principle, but for me, it would be. You know, this kind of relates to a question that Charles Cole is asking, how do we tighten our partnerships across generations? For example, how do we get younger black leaders and older black leaders to coalesce for the purposes of black educational liberation? Well, the first thing, you know, I love Charles and I saw he's mm -hmm. on. And the only reason I got this big green thing behind me is Charles, <laughs> Charles said, hey man, you got to order this from Amazon. Uh, so I, he, I got my <laughs> mic hooked up because of Charles. So he's trying to teach me. He's trying to keep me in the <laughs> century, right? But um, I, I think here's the way I approach this. I, I've been very, very fortunate. Uh, because I, I'm going to retire at the end of June, which is another thing. But I've been very, very fortunate to have people like you, Charles, um, Serge, all, all of these folks who still believe I have something to say to them as younger people. 
And so I've been blessed to be able to, to work with younger people, meet with them and talk with them. But like I told Charles, and he and I are gonna do some things together, it's it's a it's a learning experience that goes both ways. Mm-hmm. See, I don't, I don't, I don't believe in all this stuff, Chris, of oh, you know, you get you the fountain of wisdom and and I want to sit at your <laughs> feet. First of all, why would anyone want to sit at my feet or anybody's feet for that matter? But but the issue is the way I look at it, I'm learning a lot from Charles, right? Because there, there's a whole bunch of stuff that he knows that I don't know. And so the way I think you have to do this is there has to be mutual respect. Mm-hmm. But I have to understand that I can learn from younger people. There are things that younger people can learn from me, but I'm always open to that mutual learning process. Mm-hmm. And I think that is the only way to have true intergenerational uh, relationships that can move our people forward. I think that's something that I've always found with you is that you don't um, you don't buy into this hierarchical way of of doing the relationship. When we come to you for information, you ask us questions, too. Right. Like, so it is it's it's totally mutual. But I'm not going to let you get off the hook with the special and specific role that you play within our lives and within the movement lives. We don't have anybody else actually to look to who has done the one thing that's so critical for us, which is to synthesize. Right. There's a lot of information. There's a lot of things to think about. There have been strategies. There have been tactics. There's been civil rights philosophy of how we can get our, our freedom. But few people do the synthesis and add new information and old information and kind of spit it out in a way that we can understand and, and walk away with. How are we going to teach? This is what I'm interested in in the yeah. movement for education. How are yeah. we going to teach? We can't just tell people stuff. Right. right. What to do. You know, we can't just be marching all the time either. Right. Right. So so how are we going to teach? When you say teach, you mean teach in the broader sense or teach as it relates to our kids in school? Could you? Yeah. Yeah. Out of school. I mean, I'm thinking okay. more in terms of the movement. If we want people to be activated, people like right. me and Sharif and, and Charles and others have been talking about. There's just like eight books we share in common right now that we all know. So if you were to ask us about certain things, we wouldn't have a gap in our, our understanding of certain parts of black history, for instance. Um, how we get how, how do we make that part of the movement? Well, I think we we have to keep talking about it. In other words, like when we have these conversations, it ought to be both theory and practice, right? It should it shouldn't just be, well, this is what I think. Well, you you think that based on what? I mean, what is <laughs> where, where did that come from? Did it come from your experience? Did it come from your learning? Did it come from a combination of both? And what I try to do is always to understand the relationship between theory and practice, the relationship between ideas and actions. And and, and so even though to a certain extent people say that I'm, um, I forgot the term, they said that I'm an empiricist. Uh, But but essentially, I, I, I try to be both. I mean, I don't. I don't know how you can keep talking about ideas that have never been tested in practice. Mm-hmm. Because at a certain point in time, Chris, ideas are an abstraction from reality. Mm-hmm. And if you continue to build ideas without ever taking it back to practice, then you move into another level of abstraction. Because what you're doing is you're building ideas on top of ideas. Mm-hmm. And so you're further and further away from any like real connection to reality. It feels like so, you just described higher ed. Yeah, well, because, well, you got some people who are teaching people how to teach who haven't taught anybody taught. in 20 yeah. years. I mean, what, right. you know, how you going to teach? How you going to talk to me about how to teach kids? And you ain't seen a kid, a high school kid in 20 years. Would it be unfair and, to say that that's a lot of our black educational higher ed leadership are people that write multiple books and studies to each other, exactly. like, like letters to each other constantly. Yeah. And when I point out well, which one of you has a school? Right. Like, don't talk me to death. Don't talk me to death. Show me the actual children that are in your laboratory somewhere. Is that unfair? Is that mean? Well, it's 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 not either, in my opinion. But because <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> no, you know what? No, but seriously, no. like one of the things that helps me stay grounded is working in our school. Like right now, as you know, I'm teaching you know five seniors, 
And, you know, we've been working this entire year on Brown versus the Board of Education, right? And because I'm in our school all the time and I see our kids and I'm interacting with our kids and they're teaching me stuff and I'm listening to them and, you know, and I'm understanding what teachers are actually dealing with every day, man. Hmm. I mean, the job of being a teacher, man, that's a difficult job, man. And being a principal, oh my God. I mean, so, so if, if you're not interacting on, a, on, on some kind of regular basis, you out there talking, but it's based on what? Mm. You know, where, what, what where, where, where is this coming from? But on the other hand, if you're, if you're active, but you never read anything, <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? Then you, you, yeah. you, you, can't, you, can't, you gotta function in both ways. You gotta read and you gotta work. You gotta work and you gotta read. Mm. That to me is the way you synthesize what it takes to be engaged in struggle. Like, for example, you and I were talking, you know, before we got online about the books that we're reading and how much time you got to read right now. But mm. but I sent you and Sharif and Charles, I think I sent all of you all this, I think. But it's 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 a it was a catalog of Martin Luther King Jr. speeches mm. at the Riverside Church. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The most powerful speech that Martin Luther King ever gave was not the March on Washington. It was his speech at Riverside Church denouncing the Vietnam War. Mm. That was his most powerful speech. And I, I hope you got those. Because yeah, I did. But why do you see that as more powerful than than the um, the iconic speech that everybody knows? Because what he did, man, was he came out and he talked about the nature of oppression on a world stage. Mm-hmm. He talked he ta- he talked about the relationship between what was happening in Vietnam to what was happening in this country. He 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 talked about what we're experiencing today in another realm with people like Trump at the helm. Mm-hmm. The, what he got into is what what is really the purpose of the Vietnam War? This whole idea about saving the world from communism, that really wasn't what this was all about, right? Mm -hmm. It it, it was about the continued oppression of a people. And these people had rose up, man. And and, and what Martin Luther King was trying to talk about is, who who should we be connected to in this world? Who who are the, 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 the people who are being oppressed, not only in Vietnam, but all over the world? Mm -hmm. You, You have to really listen to the way that he laid it out and laid out what is it that we should be doing at that moment. I'm saying all that simply to say, Chris, but for me, it's by listening to that. It's by going back. And as you know, I was in Corey Methodist Church when, when, when Malcolm X gave the ballot or the bullet speech. I didn't just read it. I was in Corey Methodist Church, right? Wow. And it changed the whole way I viewed myself as a Black human being. So these words that you can read and you can hear can change the way that you view the world. And then that will help you better understand how to struggle in the current world. How are you not cynical? I mean, if you think about the experiences you've had in your life, it doesn't feel like we're moving forward in a lot of ways. It feels like we've had more than we've ever had in some theoretical way. Like I hear folks all the time talk about if black people were a country, if black Americans were a country, you know, the number changes all the time. We'd be eighth in the world or we'd be, you know, whatever, you know, trillion dollar economy amongst us. It doesn't feel like we're making forward progress, though. Uh, yeah. and it doesn't feel like we have a movement that is energizing people anymore. We have a consumer culture. It feels like we're post civil rights. So what what would stop you from being a cynic right now? Well, I'm not a cynic, but I'm a pessimist. Mm-hmm. But but I'm not the type of pessimist where my pessimism stops me from getting up every day to fight. <laughs> okay, mm-hmm. so it, it, you know, like in Derek Bell's book, Faces at the Bottom of the Well, you know, he, he he was talking about he did this interview with this black woman. I think it was in Macomb, Mississippi. I always get it wrong. Or money, mm-hmm. I'm not. Sure. Mm-hmm. And you may have heard me talk about this before. But 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 he was asking her. He was like. Hey, you know, like this was in 1964. It was like, you know, white people got all the money. They got the guns. They got, you know, they got the the government. Why, why, why do you get up every day and fight, right? And she said, "Look, I'm old and I can't speak <laughs> for everybody, 
but God put me on this earth to harass white people. So, <laughs> so, so to me, one of my jobs is to harass those people who continue to oppress our people, even though, because what did they say? Is that you have to fight even if victory is not possible, mm -hmm. because not to fight is the cosign on the injustice, right? Mm -hmm. So that even though racism is like a permanent part of American society, you can't not fight against it, right? Mm -hmm. Because not to fight is to say that it's okay. And so that's what I mean when I say I'm a pessimist, because I don't see the potential for real systemic change that's going to make life better for the majority of our people, particularly our poorest people. But at the same time, Chris, I can't sit here and say, oh, because I don't see the road to systemic change, I can't get up and fight to change the lives for as many people as I can, right? That's why at the end of my book, I said that after all of these years, I've decided that education is not about systemic change. It's a rescue mission, man. It's, 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 it's like trying to rescue as many kids as we can, right? Because... That's what we have to do. So, but I'm a pessimist about the kind of deep change that needs to happen. And, 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 and let me just even prolong this for a moment. One of the tweets I sent out the other day was, I, I just couldn't stand it no more, man. I couldn't stand people talking about, oh, my God, it's taking a virus to shine the light on, <laughs> on the expression. I'm like, man, what, what, yeah. what are y'all talking about, man? Yeah, yeah. You, Chris, it was right after like Katrina, right? Mm -hmm. Remember when people were talking, about, oh, oh, we didn't know that black people in New Orleans were living under those conditions. Well, who is the we that didn't know that? Right, right. When, when, when did y'all discover that there's disparities in the health system in this country? Mm -hmm. <laughs> when, when, when did y'all find that out? And for people to stand up with a straight face and say, oh my God, we didn't know that this was happening until the virus came. And now that we know it, now that we know it, what? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What, what, what is going to be radically different for the communities that we care about on the other side of this? Here's what I see. What I see is there's going to be fewer resources, at least in the short term. You, you, you can see them slashing spending for schools, mm. for, for help. Because where is the money going to be in the short term, Chris? Mm -hmm. So so when people are sitting here talking about, oh, man, things are going to be so much better on the other side, I'm trying to figure out, how did y'all come up with that? Because mm -hmm. I see the possibility of the opposite, mm -hmm. particularly in the short term. And then for even longer term, if we don't organize ourselves to fight back in both the near term and the long term. And it's not clear to me that we will. You say that you worry about the um, the potential cutting funds for schools, what are other ways that you would worry that things are going to go left for us in education? Okay, here's the thing. All right, anybody who thinks we're just going to be able to go back and do schooling exactly as we were doing it before this happened, you're like crazy, man. This, this is the moment in time, Chris, when we ought to be having meetings talking about how is our schooling going to be radically different on the other side of this. And mm -hmm. it isn't just online curriculum. Mm -hmm. It's talking about credits. What do credits really mean? Why does the school day have to be organized the way that it is? What's going to happen if they slash funding, which they're going to do most likely, mm -hmm. and you all of a sudden going to have fewer people? You're going to have fewer teachers. You're going to have fewer aides. You're going to have fewer, a whole lot of... What are, what, what are we going to do in that scenario? Does it make sense for us to, to continue to start school every day at 8 o'clock and everybody has to be there at 8 o'clock? Mm -hmm. do, do we need to go back and rethink how to vary when kids have to show and how much time do they actually have to spend in the... All of these things, to me at least, we should be thinking about right now. And the second thing, Chris, and you know this and I know this, there are already people out there who've been doing this differently for 20 or 25 years. That's right. <laughs> you know what I mean? so, so people are waking up talking about, oh, all right. oh yeah, we, we, we need to talk about online learning. People, there's been people who've been doing online learning for now 25 years. Mm -hmm. There are people out there with, with real programs that, mm -hmm. that people have been using. It's just that our community 
has never to ha had real access to that. So the question is, are we on the other side of this going to have access or are we once again going to be operating in the Stone Age while other people are moving in a totally different direction in this country? I yeah. worry about I our ability that. to understand that. I would vote for the we're going to go back to the Stone Age. And, and this is so this is my cynicism or pessimism sticking out, which is I, I actually see that there's a fight right now of the institutionalists, uh, the establishmentarians, the the status quo, whatever you want to call them, the people that have a vested interest in things staying the way that they have been um, are stronger than the people that believe that there's going to be just like an explosion of in innovation of some sort. And that, you know, like, like, here's my hope. My hope would be that parents, having had their kids back at home, start discovering their parental muscle and 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 they have something of a minor awakening like oh my god this could happen differently or oh my god what my kids have been seeing in school has been crap and i didn't know it um or now i see more why so so parental awakening in small batches might lead us to more homeschooling more um educational collaboratives more innovative things something different than what we have right now. I, I love what you just said about the credits and the start time, the way that we use hours. You know, we know it's not meant for um, a student's clock, natural clock, <laughs> like waking everybody up at the same time, making everybody do the same thing, this robotic kind of, but I fear that the people who want to go back as a matter of convenience to what we've been wanting, I mean, what we've been having are stronger than the people who have a vision for something better. Is that wrong? No, I think that's right. But what I also think is those of us who see it differently, we have a responsibility to organize as many people as we can mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. fight it, right? Be because, Chris, we're, we're never going to be at the same level of power as those people that you just laid mm -hmm. out, right? Mm -hmm. And so to a certain extent, the, the freedom struggle for us has always been a guerrilla struggle. <laughs> it's, 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 it's always been about mm -hmm. how many people can we get to see this, whether it's the eight hands and mm -hmm. you know, y'all got eight hands, we gotta turn that into 50 <laughs> hands. No, I'm serious, yeah. man, because the reality of it, Chris, is you know, you know, you heard me talk about this fact that if if you look at how organizing takes place, right? There's a small circle of people that are gonna storm the Bastille. Mm -hmm. There's a circle of people around them that's gonna hold the coats of the people who are gonna storm the Bastille. They're not storming the Bastille, but they'll hold the coats. There's another circle of people around them who will cheer for the people who are holding the coats, but they're not gonna hold the coats and they sure as hell ain't gonna storm the Bastille. Mm -hmm. So what we gotta do is to figure out who's the small group of us that are gonna storm the Bastille, who are the people that will hold the coats, and who are the people that will cheer? And then you're always trying to get the coat holders, I mean, the cheers to move to the coat holders and the coat holders to move to Storm in the Bastille. Mm -hmm. But we can't wait until everybody, everybody is prepared to storm, because everybody ain't never going to be ready to storm the Bastille. Mm -hmm. And so those of us who are prepared to fight, it's our responsibility to organize whatever group of us that is prepared to fight and to take that fight to them. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you keep trying to expand the number of people. And you may be right, Chris, that there's going to be a number of parents who are going to see this now entirely different. But a lot of those same parents are going to be trying to figure out how to live on the other end of this. How do I now go? I, my job no longer exists. The place that I used to work for is not reopening because there's a lot of that's that's going to happen, Chris. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff that has shut down is never going to reopen again. There's certain jobs that are never going to come back. And, and so what I'm saying is, at least in the near term, the, the issue is going to be for a lot of people, how, how, how do I live? How, how do I feed and clothe my family? Right. And, and, and then so so the thing about changing education may be down on the list of issues that they got to deal with in their lives. But for those of us who can focus on that, mm -hmm. we need to focus on it in a relentless way. You know, there's um, been a running theme, as I've learned from you over time. I've had two threads come from you um, that I'm trying to put together as I listen to you talk now. And I've always listened to you talk. 
One of them is you talk around this idea, not around, about this idea that education should prepare students and children for the ability to enter, engage in the practice of freedom. Right. Sounds like a heavy lecture you could give on that. <laughs> and and with many authors, and you would do this to us, you would make us read eight books to make to, to, to understand that concept. But I get it in the mind in my mind that that is like one of our bigger aspirational goals. But then what you just mentioned was the very practical um, on the ground grassroots situation that we're in right now. We may have many parents, we may have many lives upset, jobs upset, households upset, family economic security manifesting itself in ways that creates complete discord, commu community discord in a way. And I'm, I, I wanna reconcile those two things about like, do you still in the middle, in a moment of crisis expect education the fight for education still to be about the thing to help people practice or engage in freedom or do you just really do, go to a triage type of like you know um wartime type of uh thing that you need to do just to keep kids engaged in any type of learning um for a period of time yeah i think it's going to be just like the alleged reopening of the country mm -hmm. um i, I I think it's going to look different in different places. And those of us who, who, who are active in our communities, we have to have a strategy based on the reality of what's happening in our communities, right? You can't, it, it isn't like I can do something in Milwaukee and you have to do that in Oakland. It, 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 it depends on what the circumstances are in Oakland, in Milwaukee, in Philadelphia, in wherever it is we are, right? Now, what we have to do is share lessons that we're learning, but they can only be applied within the context of our actual situation. Mm -hmm. so, so those of us who, who are going to continue this struggle, and, and because I'm going to be stepping aside, I, I'm, de I'm depending on you know, you and Charles and Ray and Jamila <laughs> and Stevie and Dren. Uh, and, and you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, no, and, and Helica, Ricardo, all of y'all, right? Because I'm, I'm going to be like watching y'all, right? Uh, but, but seriously, um, we're going to have to figure out, Chris, how to help each other through this period, right? And, 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 and that means that we're going to have to be willing to share what we're doing and what we're finding out, we may have to concentrate on three or four different places to begin with because we don't have enough resources to do it everywhere. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it looks like, but some of us should be meeting right now talking about what it could potentially look like mm -hmm. on the other side. Mm -hmm. And I'm ho I know you're trying to do some of that. I know Charles is. I know, you know Lauren. Maybe there are people. But there needs to be some type of Zoom meeting, whatever it is. I know we all zoomed out right now. Yeah, but so to begin, to, begin yeah. to talk about some of the things that we can begin to do on the other side. Mm. We have a question here from Tanae. I believe Tanae Hamilton, if I'm saying your name wrong, I have to say this every day to people. I'm horrible with names, but let me know. So, um, shoot me a message. Tanae asks, what are the five books we should be reading right now in addition <laughs> to Dr. Fuller's book? Dr. Fuller's book. No struggle, okay. no progress. Okay. So it depends on what you want to know about. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If, if what you're concerned about is, I need to understand more about the history of Black education. Mm -hmm. James Anderson's book, right? Education of Blacks in the South. I think it's 1876 to 1935. Mm -hmm. That is a must-read book. If, you, if, if, you, if you're going to read any one book, on the history of black education, read that book. Mm -hmm. that, and, and, and it's not only because of the, the it took Jim 10 years to write that book. Mm. But as you all know, it's, it's documented and it will lead you to several other critical books. I'm right now like really wading through W.E.B. Du Bois's book, Black Reconstruction, because I, because I need to go back and more clearly understand what happened during that period of reconstruction uh, and, and, and what happened when they moved on us. And so to a certain extent, if you read uh, Nine Years in Power by uh, Ta-Nehisi Ta Ta Coates, he, 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 you know, you would think that that book 
was about Reconstruction or about or, or about uh, Obama years, but it's really also about Reconstruction. Mm-hmm. And, and so there, there, there are a couple essays in that that book that would really be critical. But anyway, so those are two books. I just got through. I'm almost through with White Rage by Carol Anderson, mm-hmm. which is is really an interesting book, as as you know, in terms of understanding that is not. You know, what What were white people so enraged about and what decisions did they make and how did they make those decisions? And how do you see that in terms of what it is that's actually happening today? Um, the Lost Education of Horace Tate uh, by Vanessa Siddle Walker mm, uh-huh. is, is, uh-huh. is, is, is interesting to understand black organization, right, to understand you know, how they organize the Georgia Teachers Association. But it's also interesting because it has a, a, a some quotes from a speech that Martin Luther King gave at at an annual meeting of the association where he said, I'm not for integration that takes me out of power. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it's, mm-hmm. and, and, and so just understanding how even he, the great integration, is viewed <laughs> integration is really like, Interesting. So I, I would I would suggest you read that. Democracy in Black is really interesting because, uh, as you know, he he really goes after Obama. In in in, in what I thought in some ways were unfair, but at least he gives a a, a, a good analysis of 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 what America was like and and how the system works. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm trying to get through um, uncivil rights. Uh, the teachers oh, union and race. Oh, that's a good book. In the battle for equity. Yes. Uh, yes. By uh, what is it, Joanna Pearl? Pearl. Yeah. 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 But but um, we are an African people by Russell Picard. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it, it talks about Malcolm X Liberation University, Marcus Garvey Institute. It talked about that period when we had organized these independent black educational institutions, and so there's some lessons in that book for, um, you know, going forward. So I, I think that's five, right? Yeah, let's stop on that last one, because I think that is, is so, so first of all, let's just say this. I'm glad that someone asked this question about the five books, right? Because what you just gave is a small a small library that you could give to anybody. That, like, we could actually wrap that up in a Christmas present and give it to somebody. Say, so here's the five books that, <laughs> the Dr. Fuller five books of, of, of uh, know your education history. Um, there would be so much in there to learn from the the books that you mentioned. The first one, uh, the history, the uh, history of black education in the South um, is just like a, it's it, it to me, it's like a timeline that you have to like know some of the basic plot points and milestones so yeah. that we learn from our own history, of course. Um, the, um, but this one, we are an African people is interesting to me just in that. I don't think people understand how many independent black schools there have been. Um, I don't think that people understand that we haven't always been beholden to one system uh, to get our education, that there have been attempts, fits and starts and attempts, and more than that, successful attempts to build our own schools, create our own pedagogy, our own curriculum, and serve our own kids in multiple forms, all the way from Booker T. Washington, all the way to present day folks, black folks starting schools today and running schools today. Um, How do we... How, how do we actually make a bigger point with the the educational politics that we have right now to people that one system and the delivery of education for one system will never be good for us? Like acting as if we own this one system and to step out of it is somehow heresy or a crime, right? Yeah, well, an interesting, book, so. an interesting book to read in that regard is Tyak's book, One Best System. Mm-hmm. Because we need, we need to be clear that the struggle for the one best system it has never worked. Mm-hmm. But 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 any black person who is even relatively conscious you don't you don't have to be fully conscious you just have to be relatively <laughs> conscious. conscious. Okay, will we'll know that anytime black people only had one way to do anything in America. It was devastating to us. Mm -hmm. And the notion that we ought to buy into one way to educate our children is ludicrous, man. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And, and if you don't understand, if you didn't understand it before the virus, and you don't understand it now, you're not only not woke, you're in a coma. You're not even sleep. You're in a deep coma. Because the lesson you should get out of this, man, is that when this thing hit, to see the difference between who got what and who was able to pick up and do things for their kids and had a system and this and that, versus all of us who had depended on this one way to learn, this one best system. And when that system doesn't work, we like lost, man. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and so what I'm saying, and I've always said this is, I support the traditional education system. I support charter schools. I support homeschooling. I support private schools. I support online learning. I support homeschooling. I support anything that gives us a way to gain control over our children's education. Mm -hmm. And and so there's this one little book that I would ask people to read. (laughs) See, this is what you do. No, no, what you do, but go ahead. (laughs) No, (laughs) here it comes, (laughs) y'all. No, this is a little book. Okay. It's called Exit Voice and Loyalty by Hirschman. Mm -hmm. And he's really anti-voucher, but he makes a case for vouchers. Because what he says is if you in an organization and you have no power to exit, your voice is diminished. Mm. But then if you're in an organization and you have the power to exit and you choose to stay, you develop a deeper form of loyalty to that organization. Mm -hmm. Chris, anybody Mm -hmm. with a half a brain Mm -hmm. knows that if somebody's got you in a situation and you ain't got no way out, Mm -hmm. how do you feel like your voice is gonna be strong under those circumstances? Mm The only way that our people can gain access to power is to get control over money, the decision-making process for the flow and distribution of the money in the educational system. Hmm. Because we know that an educational district or system is much of an economic enterprise as it is an educational enterprise, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. And so when you read uh, The Color of School Reform, for Mm -hmm. example, Mm-hmm. You know, where where they talk about why was it that you had these five black school districts that were controlled by black people? And at that moment, they were talking about Detroit, Baltimore, D.C., Atlanta, and I forget the other one. And they actually were talking about Detroit when Debbie was the superintendent and was saying that, look, what people keep saying, how come these ministers don't rise up because these kids are not learning? Mm-hmm. Because the school district has been the entree to the middle class for so many black people. Mm -hmm. And so when you roll up in here talking about we need to radically change this school district, you're talking about radically changing people's economic circumstances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and, and so when you say, well, but you know, the the minister should be rising up. Well, who do you think is in control of the deacon board? Mm -hmm. Who who do you think is tithing in all Mm -hmm. of these churches? So that for Mm -hmm. so many of us, our economic circumstances are tied back into institutions like a school district. And I'm not saying that in anger. I'm just saying that as a fact. And so when you begin to talk about radically altering that for an education purpose, Mm -hmm. you run into the impact of that on people's economic circumstances. Mm -hmm. So, 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 but, but what I keep trying to tell people is I'm not asking you to take a vow of poverty. I'm asking you to say, I want to construct alternative systems for our kids to learn, but I will also be employed in those systems. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know what I mean? So, so, so it isn't like I'm saying don't have an income. I'm saying have that income come to you in a different way that gives you a level of control that you do not now have. Mm-hmm. Am I wrong to, to point out, as I often do, a class difference? Um. I mean, when you talk about people who are deeply invested in the system because they have a place in it, right, and they have a role in it, um, I get the idea that it has been access to the middle class, but not for everybody, right? right. And the, the more we have black police officers um, who benefit from being a black police officer, um, we have we're going to have uh, tension in criminal justice as it's administered on the street. Sometimes you join a system and you become it. Right. Yeah. Like, like there's a way to go into these jobs with still like you're going to infiltrate and double cross. You're still going to do something for your people in that role. 
There's another way to do it and join a class, right? Um, Sarah Carpenter is in our list here. She's she's watching and listening today. And I've made this argument about her situation before. Um, in history years ago, there's a story that um, that Humphrey told Wilkins, Roy Wilkins, uh, at the NAACP that he needed to handle Fannie Lou Hamer. Yeah, I was just going to mention Sarah reminds me of Fannie Lou Hamer. Right. So <laughs> Fannie Lou Hamer was coming up from the South <laughs> speaking plainly yeah. from a position of having lived the life that she was trying to um, she was trying to advocate around. Roy Wilkins sent word to send that ignorant woman back down south, right? So this is a northern black man in a suit who's in all the right um, white meetings with all the right folks. Who's he, he himself is educated and middle class and upper middle class and enjoying the fruits of the system. And here's this so-called ignorant woman coming up from the south who did way more damage than he ever did in his lifetime. Right. And by damage, I mean, she gave the masses and common people a language that was plain to fight their circumstances. And oftentimes she was bumping up against her own people in the middle class. Right. Yep. Am I wrong to point that out, that in education, um, there are people who are deeply invested in the system being the way that it is. And some of those are our own people. Yeah. You know, Chris, like I, I, First of all, you and I agree on this. We <laughs> we had this conversation in New Orleans, you know, several years ago when mm -hmm. you were like yeah. railing on, you know, bougie niggas from. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm sorry. That's good. I was raising. No, no, I, right. Yeah, but yeah. I, okay. So let, let's be clear. There there are black people who pursue their class interests over anything else, mm -hmm. and there are black people out here who have disdain for the masses of our people. Mm -hmm. Malcolm X said that one of the things that has hurt us the most is that they have taught us to hate ourselves. Ooh. There is nothing worse than a bougie, self-hating Negro mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who has a responsibility for the rest of our people, right? There's nothing worse than that. Mm -hmm. But what we have to be clear about and, and, and when people use words like common people, this or that, I I mean, like, I love Sarah. I, all I see is a leader. All I see is someone who, who, who cares deeply, someone who's prepared to fight, mm -hmm. someone who's experienced it. In fact, when, when, when Sarah and I had that little interchange with Elizabeth Warren, the, the way that Elizabeth Warren treated Sarah, if you look at that little six minute video, it, it was just unconscionable to me. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. what's worse is for some black person to treat her in that way. right? Now, I want to stick with this point just for a yeah. second here, just to say this. When they come for Sarah, yeah. including our own people, when they come for Sarah, they come down their nose. Oh, yeah. They come oh, yeah. looking down their nose. Oh, yeah. At a person who's living in a, in, in a situation in a system where um, where it's not abstract. Right. Like if you visit Sarah in, in Memphis, it's not abstract. Cool. She, she's not talking about theory or abstractions. And what you said is absolutely true. She's actually more, more valuable and worth more as a leader than some of these folks that will look down their nose at her. Right. But but but, but Chris, just like we talked about what does it take to have intergenerational relationships? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We also have to say, what does it take to have, I'm going to use the word cross-class relationships? Okay, let's and do it, this. It, Help me. <laughs> well, no, but, but Chris, first of all, it starts with understanding that we all have a role to play out here, but that if there is respect. So for example, if I sit down and have a conversation with Sarah, and I think the only one who can impart any knowledge in that interchange is me, that's when you go wrong. Mm -hmm. I can tell you all the things I've learned from Sarah. So, so there's a role for people with PhDs, with master's degrees, with no degrees or whatever, but it mm -hmm. all begins with our respecting what we can bring to the table, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and most important, respecting the fact that you are in this battle with me. So, mm -hmm. so, so, when, we, so when we had um, the Freedom Coalition for Charter Schools and the Powerful Parent Network, there were some people who saw us in conflict. 
I never understood that, Chris. That to me was stupid. Well, I think a lot of people want there to be conflict. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah. that was yeah. idiotic, right? I mean, yeah. we were in this fight together, right? It, it was, and, and we, we were playing different roles, but, but I always had the utmost and continue to have the utmost respect for all of the people in the Powerful Parent Network. They don't have to agree with every thing that I'm saying at every moment in time, but they know that I care deeply for them. I care for the same kids that they're fighting for, mm -hmm. and we can work together across these different organizations. But what happens is many times there's, there's jealousy, there's who's the leader, and, and then the, the, the kicker is where am I going to get the money from? I'm competing with you to get this money. And so I got to show the people who got the money that I'm out here doing this. And so they get the money to me instead of to you. Those are the kind of destructive things that always happens in a movement. Man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can advance when we don't allow that to happen. I'm not going to allow anybody to get between me and Sarah. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to, oh man, well, she said this and you said, no, no, no. I love her. What did she say? Yeah, I agree with her. <laughs> you know, because we got to stay together. And anybody who gets into this bougie notion and starts looking down their noses at people because they don't have the same level of education or this and that, mm -hmm. I don't have no time for that, Chris. I don't have mm -hmm. no, and, and, and none of us should have any time for this. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is that does creep into our movement. And we have to call it out when we mm -hmm. see it because it's destructive. You know, it's interesting. Uh, last week, someone made the point about me through some back back channels. How is he in the position that he's in? He's not even educated. Uh, this is just said last week in a, you know, in a meeting amongst people that somehow matter, you know, in a way, people who have power and 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 money and influence, uh, literally said, you know, what is he doing in the role that he's in leading an organization? He's not even educated. Uh, and I'm happy with the quote that you said earlier with the woman down South who said, my job just in life is to antagonize these people. Right. Like, like I actually love to look at, at Sarah and others and see them on the come up and say, I know that this is, is going to be on, this is going to be hard for some people to accept that people can speak for themselves and that they can agitate and organize on themselves. But that's, what you just described, the point that I want to make about what you just described, I don't think is movement behavior. I think it's nonprofit behavior. As somebody who's been in the nonprofit sector for, for two decades and definitely been in community-based nonprofit sector, many of us in nonprofit just have a way of being, like the way that we do grants, the way that we uh, compete for the money and, and say we're not competing, but we really are and all of that. That's just nonprofit behavior, right? Um, but that's not really movement behavior. What, what you just exampled, the powerful parent network and the, the uh, Free Charters Coalition. I'm sorry, I'm butchering the name here. What was the, the Freedom, Coalition. Coalition. So Freedom Coalition yeah. actually um, is a good example of how it's movement behavior. You show up at the same time to do a similar thing. You don't worry about all of the nonprofity you know, constraints on the side, but we don't see much of it. I'll just be very honest with you. We don't see a, a, an awful lot of that. What's it going to take to get us to that, that point where we, um, where we can all work together and we don't have to worry about budgets and who's getting what money and which funder is needs to see us being the leader and all of that stuff. Yeah. Well, since I'm stepping aside at the end of June, you are not stepping aside. Y'all yeah, yeah, yeah. gonna have just, to work. Y'all gonna have to work that out. This man. is not happening. But, but, but Chris, <laughs> yeah. let, let me come back to a point you made. Let's make a distinction between education and schooling, <laughs> because they're not the same. There mm -hmm, are people mm -hmm, who are mm -hmm. educated but are ignorant. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You you get educated not only through schooling, but through life's lessons. And, and, and so there's formal education, and then there's the education that takes place every single day. What people need to understand is our kids are not just, quote, educated in school. Mm -hmm. Our kids are educated mm -hmm. in all aspects of their lives. Mm -hmm. What they see, what they experience is a part of their education. And what we need to quit thinking is that because someone has a degree, mm -hmm. they're educated. Mm -hmm. What they have is a degree. Some of them are ignorant, man, and they got mm -hmm. degrees. There are people who don't have degrees that are smart as hell. And it all depends upon what's the learning that you're manifesting at any moment in time. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And where did that learning come from? There are people out here who are self-taught. There are people out here who, who learn. I, I myself learned so much more about our history after I got out of school than I did in school because I'm, I'm always engaged in lifelong learning. And so when people say you're not educated, Chris, I don't even know what that means. First of mm -hmm. all, I, mm -hmm. what, what does it even matter? Mm -hmm. But the question is, I don't know what it means. Yeah, I think it's that Roy Wilkins dynamic, though. I really do. I think it's that Roy Wilkins tell that ignorant fool to sit down. Yeah, tell him to tell him to stop making this noise. Tell him to become educated. I had one professor say to me, "It's my job to produce knowledge for society. That's what I do." <laughs> right? Literal words. Like I had never heard that before. Like like so we have these people, these priests of education that just sit around producing knowledge for all of society, and then the rest of us ignorant heathens just take whatever crumbs we can get out of them as it falls from the sky, you know, out of these colleges <laughs> or what, like, like, like what, what, you know, like, um, I want to say to them until you have slept in a Ford Fiesta and had room roommates, uh, you can't, you can't compare with me. You can't compare with me. Cause I had exactly that relationship, uh, with, with homelessness and, and, and with things. It's not to brag about it. I like where I'm at in life. I got a library in my house. My kids eat well. Things are fine. I've never been raised to think that being successful or doing something in life is somehow something you should be ashamed of and wrong. But I do think that there's a bit of chauvinism within education that is damaging for the people. And I, you know, I hope we get over it at some point. No, we're, we're again, we go back to who the we is. There's mm -hmm. a group of we who ain't never going to get over it. Mm -hmm. What we have to do is find the people who are over it, right? In mm -hmm. other words, what, what we have to do is identify who's prepared to fight, who's, who's prepared to work across class, generations, whatever, for the sake of our people. Mm -hmm. And whoever those people are, Chris, that's who we're going to have to unite with. I got a lot of respect for you and Sharif and Charles and Ray and, and uh, Erica you know, y'all spend time going after people like Diane Ravage and all these. <laughs> Don't, start. Like, Don't start. Don't <laughs> start. I got a lot of respect for y'all, man, because whenever anything comes across my timeline or, or my Twitter feed from these people, man, I press delete, man. But but <laughs> but I get that, you know, that y'all have to go to battle with them. But there needs to be a group of us who don't mess with them, man, who don't spend no time even listening to what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And, but spend time like trying to organize those of us that we can talk to while some of you all go to battle with them. Again, it's mm -hmm. a division of labor. All of us don't have to be doing the same thing out here, right? Mm -hmm. But what we can do is develop mutual respect for what we bring to the table mm -hmm. that our people need at this moment in history. Wow. That to me is what's critical. So as we wrap, that is a powerful point. Um, what I've learned in this time with you today are a few things. Number one, I learned this thing around interest convergence being a powerful organizing tool when the dominant society or dominant culture is really invested in something happening and you have an interest that aligns with that, you, you're going to have more success in making it happen. But what you also told us today is there's a line that you draw on how far you could go with that. Your line is Trump. <laughs> um, and, and, and for you, going, going along with Trump would be a bridge too far. You also said this thing about intergenerational respect. We all learn from each other. There is no kind of like one-way system of learning. We all need to, to see each other. You also said this thing that I think is really important to the movement is not everything starts out as a mass movement. Not everything is far and wide and everybody doing the same thing at once. The guerrilla um movements the small movements it aligns with something my sister nakima Le levy pounds or levy armstrong now um has said to me for years which is she's always said i'll take 12 people on fire before i'll take 50 lukewarm people <laughs> right and and i i didn't used to like that in the beginning when she would say that to me because i always thought of things in big numbers right you need numbers you need and she was like no you could do way more with 12 people on fire than you can with with you know the masses like looking for a bunch of people to to come and do something um and i think you also where we will end and and wrap up is this respect for what everybody brings to the table Right. I might need to develop more respect for people that come to the table with all of the fancy book learning and all of the institutional knowledge and the people who produce knowledge. And they might have to have more respect for me 
Um, and Sarah might need to walk into rooms where people are more prepared to, to offer respect. Um, we might just need to do that, have an outbreak of respect amongst each other before we can get anything done. We need a respect pandemic, right? Uh, before we can get anything done. Um, Dr. Fuller, is there any last thoughts that you, that you think we should say to people before, uh, before we go? No, the only thing I would say is, I, I, first of all, I really appreciate spending this time with you. And, um, I just want all of my people out there to be safe, man. I, I you know, I'm, I'm worried about this fool is going to push to open up this country without testing, without the ability mm. to trace and all these things that need to happen. And again, the people who are going to bear the brunt of this are going to be, you know, black and brown people and poor people. But I couldn't end this, though, Chris, without saying how grateful I am to all of the people who are in the given health care, people who have given their own lives trying to save other people's lives and other mm -hmm. people who are out here doing, quote, the essential things so that you and I can be on this uh, this interview today. And so I just want to thank all of those people from the bottom of my heart. And I, I don't want any of us to leave without understanding that as of a few minutes ago, 40,685 people mm. have lost their lives in this country. Mm -hmm. And every single one of those people are human beings who had loved ones and families. And so we should not get to the point where when those numbers come across the stream, we don't stop and think for a moment that this is horrible. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and, and at some point, Chris, we have to make these people pay who ignored what was coming down the pike mm -hmm. and who are now getting ready to talk about, oh, let's reopen and expose so many of our, our friends and our families to this virus. So mm. I just want everyone to stay safe, man, and take care of yourselves and your families. Yeah, I don't think that there's ever a silver lining, as people are saying, to a pandemic that takes lives, but there definitely is a learning opportunity about all of the inequities, as we said earlier, all of the inequities that uh, are laid bare when you have a situation as we do now. And we're seeing all the worst in politics, all of the worst in our infrastructural challenges, everything come out. Dr. Fuller, the book is um, No Struggle, No Progress. The uh, Citizen Ed Education and Power uh, broadcast is giving away three of these to the first three people that email me. My email is Christopher at activist dot com. Again, that's Christopher at activist dot com. The first uh, three people who send me an email will get a copy of this book. Um, if you are interested in some of the books that uh, Dr. Fuller mentioned during this broadcast, the Eight Black Hands are going to have a learning series, and Dr. Fuller is, is part of that. And you want to um, to join us for a learning opportunity over a period of time. Um, also, send me an email, or if you know how to get in touch with Charles Cole, who is on this uh, in this thread right now, he can help you make that happen. So again, three copies to the first three people that come through. And Dr. Fuller, I was waiting to tell you this until the end, but the Stewart family is making a donation to the Dr. Howard Fuller Collegiate Academy today. <laughs> um, fantastic, man. We are making, uh, the Stewart family is making a thousand dollar contribution in the hopes that it can help one, two, three, however many students have something that they need right now. I don't know if it's a Chromebook or whatever it is. Stewart family is making a donation to Howard, uh, Dr. Howard Fuller Collegiate Academy. If any of you are interested in doing the same, you can find them at howardfullerca.org. That is the school in Milwaukee that has been named for Dr. Fuller. Please make a donation there too. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for watching us each day. Um, this is what we do. We, we hope to learn from each other and with each other. May God bless you all. Peace. Thanks, Chris.